So we've been in this series. How, man, whoa, any given day. I don't know about you, but I got some practical application off of Scripture and that series that I can apply to my life. Anybody with me on that? Like that series... Wow, when you can take scripture and you can find the practical application that can just go into everyday life with you. And I know, I know a lot of times it's seen like, well, you're the pastor, you kind of already know all that. Can I just tell you, anytime I teach, I'm learning at the same time. I'm learning with you, um, I'm learning the same things you're learning. And I'm just excited about what God's doing. And, and last week, man, so we learned about marriage. We learned about finances. We learned about um, parenting, right? I don't know about you, but I mess that one up all the time. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that one's tough. And then last week, Dylan did a great job really talking to us about using our platform for Christ. And some, It was a very different type of service. If you missed that, go back and watch it on the website because I'm telling you, there was some golden nuggets dropped uh, on that. And, and, and it's just life-changing stuff. So just excited about what God's doing here. You can go ahead and turn in or on your Bibles to John chapters 3 and 4 is really where we're going to camp out most of the time today. Listen, and uh, I see it happening happening soon here, but in that first service, man, we had to bring out some extra chairs around here to fit all the people in the room, you know, and I don't know about you, but that's what we want to do, that's what we want to do, and so I just want to invite you to keep inviting, keep bringing people with you, because we want to open those curtains up and go all the way back here soon, we want to keep adding chairs, we got the chairs to do it, and I don't know about you, but God's changing my life, and I know he's changing a lot of your lives, and there's so many more that God wants to change, so um, so, so today we're, we're starting a brand new series called Flatline. And if you're taking notes, and I, I hope you are, and I encourage you to do so, because like we say around here, that fire starts with paper, and so we want you to take notes so you can go home, you can read about it, you can study on your own, you can pray and see what God wants you to apply uh, outside of church as well. But if you're taking notes, here's the title of the message, It's Not What It Seems. It's Not What It Seems. Have you guys ever been to, uh, we'll put it like this, you ever been to a new restaurant, right? And you're not familiar, okay, you're not familiar with the menu, you know what I'm saying? Some of you guys, when you go to restaurants, you get the exact same thing every time you go to that restaurant, don't you? I'll take the chicken tenders with mac and cheese. And I'm like, you're 43 years old, okay? That's what my six-year-old gets, okay? Let's get a, let's get a good, good adult meal here, okay? But you get this, I'm just kidding with you. But you get the same thing no matter, you know, no matter what. And then you go to a new restaurant, what happens? You sit there and you don't know the menu, but you're talking. And it's like you're dumbfounded all of a sudden. I don't know about you, but I do this, and I will stare at the menu. You know what I'm saying? For like 10 minutes. And I'm not even reading the menu. I'm just sitting there, and I'm staring at the menu, and it's like, dear God, by some holy transaction between your spirit and my spirit, tell me what the almighty God in heaven wants me to order today. Because I don't know. I've never been here before. I don't know what's good. Is it the spaghetti? And you go to those restaurants, they have like spaghetti, and then they have hamburgers, and then they'll have something like, I, I don't know, like pizza, or the, I, they just have this wide gamut of, they got like sushi. Pizza, hamburgers, and sushi. Don't even match. Not even of the same origin. It's your problem, right? And so you stand there and you're just like, I, I don't, I don't, Lord, I need you. Not, this is not the time to be silent in my life. Okay? And then you're with a group of people. And uh, I'm going to throw my wife under the bus. She is the slowest orderer of all time. I will, I will put her, she's not in here, so I can say that. I, I will, oh, she is in here, never mind. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Learn from me, man. Learn from me. She's the slowest order of all time, though. I'm already in the story. I might as well keep going at this point. <laughs> and and she, she, she will walk in knowing, knowing exactly what she wants to order. But as soon as the menu comes out, it's like, oh, my goodness, I didn't know there's so many options. <laughs> okay? And what happens is when you're in that moment, and you're with a group of people, it never fails, somebody gets thrown out under the bus. So the waitress will come around, and they'll go. They'll go. Are you ready to order? And without asking... I'm usually the one that does this, but without asking, somebody will go, yes, ma'am, we're ready, and here's what I'd like. The whole table begins to order, and then it gets to you. You've read three choices. You've prayed by a holy transaction that God would tell you exactly what you need to eat for lunch this day. And he is silent on the matter. 
It comes to you and you're like, I don't know. And the waitress with her little notepad and her pen, and her pen not blue or black ink, because that's just too normal, purple or pink glittery ink, <laughs> stands over your shoulder and goes, take your time. <laughs> Knowing she don't mean it. Because you know what she's sitting there doing? She's trying to remember their order in the 16 sweet teas that somebody is begging her to bring them for the past five minutes, and they won't leave her alone, right? And so she's sitting there going, take your time. And she's breathing down your neck. Take your time. And you're sitting there, and you feel pressured. And so you just go, double bacon, cheeseburger, no lettuce, onion rings, let's go. Ain't even close to what you want. Or maybe, maybe you just go, yeah, I'll take that. And you, like, point to a side of Brussels sprouts. And when you order it, you're just like, and she, she don't give you a minute. She don't give you time. They don't give you time. And I'm not hating on waiters or waitresses because I think you guys are servants of the most high God. <laughs> I couldn't do your job. But Janet, they don't give you time in that moment to re replace your order because you should have been ready because you were standing there for 10 minutes staring at the menu. So they take your order. They write it down. Thank you. Have a good day. Bring it to you as soon as possible. And they walk off. And then you go, I didn't want Brussels sprouts. But they bring the Brussels sprouts, you eat them, and you doctor them up with enough salt and enough pepper and oregano and whatever else they got on there. You put some sriracha sauce on there. Praise God. I just got introduced to that on Thursday. It's amazing. And you eat it. Or, or you know, I'm being a little facetious and, and, and funny in the matter, but, you know, you, you go to these restaurants, and, and have you ever done this? I know I've done that. I did this this week. You go and you eat something, right? And you're, you walk away and you go, I can't eat another thing. But what I ate, I, I, it's not even what I wanted, right? It's not even what I wanted. I don't even feel good about it. Like, I'm full, but I don't feel good about being full. I, I just, 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 just didn't. I use this phrase, and, and, and you probably use this phrase too. It just didn't, what, hit the spot, did it? It just didn't hit the spot. That just didn't hit the spot. So you go to bed feeling miserable, but you're miserable about being miserable because you're miserable about what you ate. And here's the thing. A lot of us, we do that in life. We, go to, we, we, we get up in the morning and we eat all day long. We eat things that we think we want. We eat things that we've ordered into our life and we put into our life and we, die and we eat and we eat and we eat of the busyness and we eat of the authority and we eat of all these things. And, 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 and the reality is we eat all day long, but whenever it's just us and we're laying down at night and our head is on the pillow and we're in the bed covered up, we're watching Sports Center to try to go to sleep, and all of a sudden what happens is we realize, I'm really, really filled up today. I had a really, really filled up day, but I am not. It just didn't hit the spot. There's something missing there's something that just doesn't bring that joy about being so filled up you know what i'm saying like it was you know what i'm saying like you you go through the day and you're just like i can't fit in one more thing i'm gonna bust if i do anything else i'm so stressed to the max if anybody looks at me the wrong day wait so help me god i will bite their head off but the bust but then you lay down and it's like i i don't know why, like, I'm about to bust and I can't eat one more thing, but it's just not, it's not hitting the spot. It's, it's not, because the reality is we can be filled and not fulfilled. And see, the thing is, is we do that so much in life and, and we get really busy, but we're never satisfied. We can have all kinds of stuff and be so stressed out that we don't know how to enjoy it. We got so many, so many authoritative responsibilities that we have to uphold because we are that important of a person but we hate every second of it. We get to a place to where we lay down and we're trying to digest everything that we've eaten that day in life, and as we're digesting it, we're going, I, 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 don't, I don't even like myself right now. I don't like people. I'm stressed out. I'm edgy. My wife don't want to talk to me. My kids don't want to play with me. All I need to do, and I don't even feel like playing with them. Like, I want to come home. I want to close the door. I want to lock it. I want to take a bath, and I want to go to sleep, and I want to leave everybody else alone because I don't have time for anybody else except what I got because I'm about to bust. And not, not, not satisfied. And today, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes about that concept. About the concept that, that, that sometimes, oftentimes, a lot of times in life, you can be filled with good things and still miss the fullness of Jesus. We can be so filled with good things that we miss the fullness of Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 10 talks about this a little bit, and it says this. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Let's just camp out there for a second. A lot of times... 
Can I just tell you, and, and, and most of you know this whether you've grown up in church or not, but you have an enemy that is out to destroy your soul. But here's the thing. He's not going to show up in your life and go, hey, PSA, just wanted you to know, walked into your life, going to kill you now. No, what he does is he sneaks in the back door and he starts stealing your joy. So over time, you begin to get unhappy about the things that used to bring you joy all the time. And it's not that those things aren't joyful to you anymore. It's that now you're stressed out about them so much you can't learn to have joy in the midst of heartache. He steals our joy and then he kills our drive. Like we used to be driven people that we had a passion and a desire in life and this is what I'm going for and I know this is what I'm going to do. And he begins to kill the drive where it's like, I just want to go home and I just want to go to sleep. I don't want to do anything else. I don't have any drive. I don't have any desire. I don't want to be, listen, there's days I, don't, I just don't even want to parent you. I don't want to love you. I don't even want to like you. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't, and he begins to destroy your drive. And then, or kill your drive, and then he begins to destroy your purpose because after the joy is gone and after he's killed the drive, then all of a sudden we begin going, what, what am I even here for? I, I used to know. Like, I, I, I used to know, and I used to get it all, and I used to figure it all out, but now I, I just, I don't even know the purpose of my life. Like, I, I just don't, I don't get it. And the enemy's not going to walk in and go, hey, I'm here to steal, kill, and destroy you. But what he will do is over time, two years after you gave your life to Jesus, you begin doubting your purpose, you begin losing your joy, and you start, he starts killing the drive that you had for everything in life. In two years, three, six months, uh, four years later, you're sitting there and you're going, I don't know what happened, but somebody snuck in and destroyed everything that I was building. Somebody struck in and destroyed everything about my life. Somebody came in through the back door, an ungated area, an unguarded area, and now I am so miserable at life that if you look at me the wrong way, I think you're talking about me. And we, we, we get this spirit of offense that rises up in us, and now what the enemy begins to do to destroy us is he destroys the relationships that we're connected to because now we think they're going around behind our back doing things that they weren't even thinking about doing. And so he cuts off relationship and connection. And what happens is, is Jesus makes a statement. He, he identifies the enemy, right? And then he says this, I came. I want you to know what the enemy does, but I came. That those that he's stealing from, those that he's killing, those that he's destroying, I came that they may have life, that they may have life and have it abundantly. In other words, I came that they may come to a place to where he can't steal from them, and he can't kill them, and he can't destroy them because my life is bigger, my life is greater, my grace is stronger than anything the enemy can do to you because I came to give you life and life more abundantly than you ever thought you could have I came come on somebody I came and, 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 and part of the listen can I just be real if you don't have a relationship with Jesus today I give you permission for just a moment to take a step back from this portion from this statement I just want to tell those of us that are walking in a relationship with Jesus if we can't get excited about the fact that Jesus came to give you and everybody else life then I don't know that we've really encountered the full life of Jesus the way that he intended it to be because it's not a quiet life it's not a passive life it's not a life to where we sit back and go thank you God that's awesome but we stand back and we go yes I I got life better than I ever thought possible through the cross of Jesus. I may get it wrong, but he got it right. That is life. And if we're, Dylan said it last week, and it's hit me all week. If we aren't vocal, if we are willing to be vocal and ex exhibit our relationship with Jesus, do we really have one? Is it really faith if we don't do something with it? He said, I came to give life and life more abundantly. And here's... Here's the thing I love about what Jesus is saying here. This is not an exclusive promise. He doesn't look and go, hey, if you messed up last night, this ain't for you. Hey, you know, when you woke up this morning to go to Radiate Church, greatest church in Kershaw County, greatest church in the state of South Carolina. You know, when you woke up to come to church this morning and you said three cuss words because you didn't want to get ready. And you had to beat your kid on the way out because they went and put the pants on. Not really beat them, but you know what I'm saying. You know that, that, that moment 
that ain't for you now. Good job, you just excluded yourself. He didn't look and go, hey, you know that bar you were hanging out in Friday night? Good job, this promise ain't for you. Hope you enjoy Jim Beam, because you ain't getting Jesus Christ. Sometimes I need a filter there, Harrison. <laughs> but <laughs> the promise of Jesus here is this. It's inclusive. Hey, I know you went to the bar Friday night, but if you'll give your life to me, I promise you, you won't need a bar where I'm taking you. Hey, hey, if you'll, if you'll give your life, listen, I, I know, I know, I know you don't want to go to church right now, but when you begin to understand the importance of a family and the body of Christ and the importance of the local church, you'll want to go to church and you'll want to bring everybody you can. See, see, whenever you come to a place where you understand that I came to give life and life more abundantly, you'll submit whatever you need to submit. But all I need you to do to begin with is I need you to understand I came to give life and life more abundantly and he came to kill you and destroy you and steal from you and and you got to choose one see it's an inclusive it's inclusive it doesn't matter as long as you have breath in your body and blood in your veins as long as you're living you got purpose and you got promise of an inclusive relationship with Jesus Christ but how does he do that let's flip over real quick to John chapter 3 verse 30 it's a real small verse easy verse to be quite honest with you and John is speaking here and talking after a story and he says these these seven words he must increase but i must decrease see see here's the thing to the abundant life with jesus he has to increase in our lives but 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 john doesn't stop with he must increase because that's absolutely true right that doesn't that doesn't take away the truth of the statement but then he goes but in order for him to increase in your life but I, John, I, a disciple, I have to decrease. And so what he's, in other words, what he's saying is, in order for me to be filled with more of him, I have to get rid and make some room for the Savior of the universe in my life. He must increase and I must decrease. And, and see, when we hear the word decrease, automatically our mind goes to the word um, we lose something loose. We lose something. And you know what? Yes. But kingdom principles, the kingdom of God, works a little differently than anybody else. It's not just losing something, but it's losing something to gain everything. My paraphrase later in the, in the Gospels, in the Scriptures, is Jesus looks and he says, if you want to gain your soul, you have to be willing to lose it all. I mean, think about it. I'm not going to go into the rabbinical or the Jewish culture of, 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 of discipleship and the rabbinical things there, or, or rabbis and stuff, but I'm going, to, I'm going to mention it for just a second in, in this sense, that in order to be a disciple of a rabbi, do you know what you had to do? You literally had to walk away from your job, from your family, from your home, from the comfort of your house, everything. You had to look and go, I want to be a disciple so bad, I will give up whatever you tell me to give up to walk with you to gain everything that I need to gain from you. And here's the interesting thought. When Jesus goes to the first 12 guys, the 12 disciples, he looks at them, and they are, they are all doing something of a family trade. They're all working. Do you know what that tells me? If you go back and you study the rabbinical tradition of being a disciple, that tells me that they were already denied by a former rabbi or teacher. And Jesus walks up to him and he goes, you, right there, get off the fishing boat and let's go win some people for Christ. Hey, you, stop being a doctor, stop being a tent maker, stop doing all this, stop doing your family trade. Leave everything you have behind and come and follow me. See, the thing of a relationship, a fulfilled, a fulfilled life with Jesus is this. It's not about just praying a prayer, but it's about submitting your heart. It's about saying, I'll... I'll give up what I need to give up to do what you need me to do because I love you. And John, and there's also a verse in John that says, I, we love because he first loved us. 
That's looking at Jesus and going, dude, because you gave your life, because you love me, because you took every sin that I could ever commit and you placed it on a cross and placed it on your bloody body and you've breathed your last and you killed, you, 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 you held the, uh, the, uh, the keys to death, hell, and the grave and you rose up from the grave three days after death. Because of that, I will submit anything you tell me to submit in my life to you because I love you because you first loved me and I will be your disciple. I must decrease. He must increase. John chapter 4, I'm going to read 15 through 18. But beginning in verse 7, there's a really awesome story that if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard. If not, don't worry about it. We're going to talk about it for just a minute. But 7 through 14 really sets up the background for the story where there's a Samaritan woman that comes to the well to get a drink. And, 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 and that, the well then was like a Starbucks. I know it sounds funny, and it is, but it's true. It was the gathering place. It's where they hung out. It's where they all went to eat, and, I mean, drink and just meet people. And so a Samaritan woman shows up at the well, and Jesus is there. And Jesus looks at her, and he says this, hey, give me a drink. She goes, you don't even have anything to get water out the well with. Why am I going to give you a drink? And he looked at her, and he makes this statement later on in the scripture. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him or me, and he would have given you the living water. In other words, you don't know who you're talking to. I can give you living water that will never run dry and you won't ever have to worry about anything again. And I love verses 15 through 18, which is where I want to go today because I, I don't know about you guys, but I love awkward conversations. I don't love them for my life. Like for me, I get uncomfortable personally because I'm like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what to say to you right now. But I love instigating awkward conversations and moments with other people. I love it. I do it as much as I possibly can. Especially if I have a good relationship with you and your wife, watch out because I will instigate some things between y'all, okay? Just, and then I will back out and I will watch and love it. And then I'll offer free counseling later. And uh, <laughs> verses 15 through 18, a very awkward conversation takes place and it says this. It says, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. In other words, she goes, okay, okay, Mr. Living Water, you got this water that'll never run dry, and, and, and I'll never be thirsty again. Okay, all right, give it to me. Give it to me then, because I'm sick of coming to the well. I'm sick of walking all the way over here from Samaria all the time to get what I need to get. Give it to me then. And then, verse 16, he said to her, go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly uh, said, I have no husband. And I can see when he says that, all of a sudden she goes, who are you? You have correctly said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, verse 18, for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Dude, if I'd have been around, I'd have been like, ooh. That escalated quickly. Jesus looks at her and he says, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five. And you're on your sixth. And he ain't even your husband. The one you're living with, the one you're messing with, the one you're doing marital things with right now, he ain't your husband. And you know you ain't supposed to be doing it, not just on kingdom law, but on Mosaic law from back in the Old Testament. You know you're not supposed to be there. And you know they'll stone you to death if anybody knows about it. You know your life is in the balance based on a relationship that you think you have to have in order to be fulfilled, but you don't need. I want to give you three action steps today. The first one is this. I must decrease. Let me give you this shareable. I can be filled and never be fulfilled. See, she's on her sixth relationship. I want you to hear that. See, the first relationship didn't fill her like she thought it would, so she walks away. She goes to number two, didn't fill her. Three, no filling. Four, doesn't fill her. Five, nah, he ain't cutting it. Six, maybe he'll do it. And see, the thing isn't the relationship. I want you to think deeper than the surface relationship. It's a moment of she's going, nothing is fulfilling the hole in my life that I'm living and laying down with because it's just not hitting the spot. Maybe somebody else can hit the spot. Maybe another relationship can hit the spot. Maybe something else in my life can hit the spot because this one's not. So I'll chase relationships. And, 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 and listen, I know it's easy to look at that, 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 that story and go, oh, man, she's wrong. But we do it. We do it all the time. 
And some of you are sitting there today going, I feel like that. I'm chasing everything to fill a hole, but it never fills it. Can I tell you? It's, it's like this. Let's say this jar represents our life. And, and I've actually heard people say this, and, 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 and we'll talk more about this later, but um, I've heard people say, you know, if I have kids, if I have kids, my life will be complete. No, your life will be busier, but it'll only be complete with Jesus. And so we, we have kids, which are, obviously there's nothing wrong with you. kids. I have two. Uh, they don't look like Anna. If you have a kid that looks like Anna, go sign a contract with Disney um, and tithe. Um, <laughs> we got kids on our plate, right? And then, man, you know what? I got me a good job. I just got promoted. I got a good job, and I'm doing well. And, 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 then, and with that job, I got to have a way to get rid of some stress. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got to. If my hand will come out, I got to have a way to get rid of some stress. So I got me a, a hobby. I go and, I go and uh, uh, play golf. And I'm a member of a country club. <laughs> country music. Anyway, um, y'all didn't know I knew all that, did you? I got, I got a, ho- a hobby that I, I have to play with the guys at the country club at least, at least, at least once a week. Because I, I got to be good at golf because I can't go out there and look dumb playing golf. You know what I'm saying? Can't do that. And then, man, because of that, I got, I got some money. I got some good money. I'm doing good, doing all right, paying my bills. You know, I can go, go out to eat when I want. I can be a part of the country club. I can do what I need to do. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and man, look, look, I got me two nice cars, two nice cars. Like, they look good. They fast. People, I'm impressing people I don't even know. And if I did, I wouldn't like them anyway. But they impressed by my cars. I love it. And I got me a little motorcycle. <laughs> I love my motorcycle. Got me a motorcycle. I got it. It makes a lot of noise. A lot of noise. In fact, people got to roll up their windows whenever I pull up next to them at a stoplight because they just can't take the noise. You know what I'm saying? And not only that, I ride all that stuff and I come to church on Sundays. I'm here on Sundays, but I got to be in charge. And don't tell me what time to get to church to serve because I'm in charge when it comes to work. And I'm the CEO of my company, but I come in and you ain't going to tell me what to do. I pay my tithes just like you do. Too bad it ain't a tra- business transaction. It's the heart of God. But anyway, um, oh, that's good. You see, I got my, I, I serve and I'm there and I, I do it half heartedly and, and I do it because they expect me to do it and I need to please the pastor and, and, and my wife serves, so I need to serve too. And, and we got our position at work. And see, the problem is here's the thing. Listen, listen, listen. I'm not trying to discourage anything because here's what you'll notice none of that stuff is bad, is it? None of it's bad. In fact, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting nice new cars. I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting raises. I don't think there's anything wrong with serving at the church. Clearly, I think that's how you grow closer to God, right? I I, I don't think there's anything wrong with golf. I don't think there's anything wrong with kids, motorcycles, none of that stuff. But here's the problem. It's not the stuff that's the problem. It's the priority that the stuff takes in our life. Our plate can be so full of stuff that nothing is in the right place so it all begins to bleed in together. And then we've got all this stuff. We've got our motorcycle in there. We've got our position at the got our position at the church we got our cars and we got the country club and we got the job and we got the money because I ain't tithing but I'm going I'm to make the money you know I got all that and then I want to go God where are you so empty you promised to never leave me and you promised to never forsake me but I feel so forsaken right now in this life because when I lay down at night I got all this stuff but I am miserable and God's going, it, 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 it has nothing to do with me. Because can I tell you this? It's never about God's ability to give, but about our ability to receive. Every time. God wants to give us everything we got. But the problem is, is often when we fill up the jar of our life like this, he has nowhere to put himself. Jesus, Jesus says it like this. That you have to have him above family. Above, prior, above anything else because he is the Lord of it all. That's why we sing holy, holy. If you go read Revelation, the angels in heaven are rejoicing and it says they are singing this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Do you know why they say holy, holy, holy? Sounds repetitive, right? Because saying something three times in the Jewish culture means perfection. And the word holy means you're high and lifted up. So they're literally saying Jesus, God Almighty, You are perfectly high and lifted up. 
above anything else. And we go through life, and we've got all this stuff that not, is not bad. It's not bad. But it's out of whack. Because if any of this takes the place of Jesus, we can be filled and never be fulfilled. We can be filled and never feel like God's doing anything in our life. Number one is, I must decrease. Number two, very quickly, he must increase. Do, do, do you know that most of you are not going to walk home today, go home today, and put your truck on Craigslist because God's just speaking to you, telling you, you need to get rid of everything that you own in order to follow me. Most of you are not going to be in that place. God may tell some of you that. Most of you, he's not going to say that. Do you know why? Because it's not necessarily a bad thing to have. But if that, the seeking of that takes over my seeking for him, then he cannot increase because all I'm worried about is everything other than himself. I believe, I don't want to get into that. He must increase. When I begin to fill my life, make room in my life, and empty out priorities in my life, here's what happens. And it never, ever, 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 ever fails. What begins to happen is he begins to pour himself out more and more and more and more and more and more because he's looking and he's saying, that area of your marriage, I can fill and you made room. That area of your parenting, you made room, I can fill. That area of your finances, you made room and I can fill. See, here's the great thing about tithe since we just talked about that. The tithe is this. It's only the starting point for making 10% room for God to fill the rest there comes a point where tithing just ain't enough anymore and you're just like dude I got to give 12 percent and God's going good because I got 12 percent more blessing I want to pour out and then well 15 and then 20 and then 25 why it's because we can't get enough of God but when I seek everything above him it's just not quite what it seems so stressed so frustrating. And, and, and it's not, again, I want to reiterate this. It's not that these things are bad. It's the level at which you place the priority on them that can be difficult. And the third thing is this. God seeks those that no one else wants. I must decrease. He must increase. And I have to know that God seeks those that no one else wants. Wants. Let me let me give you this last shareable. God will risk anything to reach anyone. See, some of you walked in today and you, you felt lost, confused. You felt you let's just be honest. You went to bed last night after your game was over. And you laid down and you just went, Today was so full of stuff, but but it's just not hitting the spot. On my story, on, on, on my drive, on our tour in Israel, we uh, were at a place to, we were driving to our next stop. And we were in this mountainous area, and it was kind of dry and very hilly. And the tour guide, she said, look, look out the side of the bus at the mountains. So we looked, and they were beautiful. And she said, do you, do you see the, the, the zigzags going up the mountains? I thought it was just part of the mountain. She, I, we said, yeah. She said, that's how the shepherd leads the sheep up the mountain. They don't walk straight up because it's too dangerous of a climb. So they go the long way, it seems like. They go like this, and they turn back, and they come back, and they do this over and over. I bet there was 50 to 75, sometimes 100 lines going up the mountain to get to the top, right? Because I don't know about you, but when I think about a sheep leading shepherd, I think of a plush pasture, right? Plenty of green to eat, flat place to walk. And so we're doing that, and, and we had the opportunity to see some shepherds leading their sheep back to, their, to where they needed to go and things like that. And she began to tell us about how whenever they're leading their sheep, they take them where they need to go to go eat because it may not be in that very area. But then before uh, dusk that afternoon, they come back and they put the sheep in the corral in a safe place. In a place, that's, place is guarded, and it's safe, and it's good, it's okay. And then if there's any sheep that are lost after the sheep are in the safe place where they're taken care of and he knows that they're going to be okay, then he goes and he'll find the lost sheep. And it reminded me of the parable that Jesus said that said, there may be 99, but I'll leave the 99 to go find the one lost sheep. 
and, and, and some of you walked in today and you feel like the one lost sheep in the crowd. And, and, and you know what the safe place is that Jesus is leading us? That's the importance of the church. That's the importance of the body of Christ. That's the importance of the life groups and the serving together. It's not just about coming and just doing. It's about being a part of a safe place to where we can be real with each other, where we can share our struggles, we can hold each other accountable, we can love each other because we're guarded. And Jesus can go, I know you're taken care of by the pastor. I know you're taken care of by the other sheep. I know you're not going to let anything happen to each other. But I've got one more in Kershaw County. I got to go find. I got one more in South Carolina. I got to go get I got one more in your family I gotta go find you go over there and be safe but I gotta go get them I gotta go get them and God listen the shepherd will walk all night long they said with no food with no rest they will wear holes in the soles of their shoes to find the sheep that was lost somewhere on the path. In other words, they will risk anything to find the one. Listen to me. Some of you, some of us, we're living life and we think this is just the way it needs to be. I'm just going to be busy and have this empty void in my life that will never be full. And I'm just here to tell you, no, you got lost somewhere on the track. And you're walking and everybody, you feel like everybody else is progressing towards their purpose with God. You feel like you're the one sheep that was left behind from your group of friends, from your church, from your place, your ministry area, and you're left on the path. And I just want to tell you something. At, at 23 years old, I laid in a hospital bed and I gave my life back to Jesus after heart surgeries. I'll share all of that next week if you come back. But the reality is, is that he will do anything to find anyone right where they are because he wants the lost sheep, no matter where you are, what you've done, or where you've come from, he will give it up to find you I know I know you did too much and you've gone too far and you've been out on that path for too long but that is the enemy trying to steal your hope kill your passion and destroy your soul and he's going no 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 see I got life I got life and I got it more abundantly. And that one sheep that's standing over there questioning everything about their life, I'm just, I need to go find that. I got to get, oh, I got to get there. I got to, if it means I die on a cross and I'm tortured to death, then so be it. There's that one person that gave up on life because of the hurt and the pain that they've been through. There's that one person that turned their heart away from anything that they've ever known. There's that one sheep that's wandering lost, wondering if they'll ever find that one that I created for them. There's that one sheep that's wondering about the purpose. There's that one sheep that's trying to be a single mother or a single father. There's that one sheep that's trying to make it all happen. They're trying to fill the void, but I will risk whatever I got to risk to go find that person because I got life and life more abundantly, and I got to get them. I got to wrap them up, and I got to carry them to the safe place. I got to get them. And I'm just here to tell you, listen, it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to be scared because all it takes... <laughs> Is a submission to the Father. To go look at Jesus and say, Jesus, I don't deserve it, but you give it. I won't always get it right, but I'll try. And when you correct me, I'll walk in that. To say, I would decrease whatever I need to decrease. If that means sell my truck, then so be it, God. But it's way more than that. It's not about your stuff. It's about your heart. I will decrease what I need to decrease. So that you can increase wherever you can increase. And in just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to walk into a full life with Jesus. And guess what? In that moment, it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. All that matters is where you're starting. And I'm going to give you that opportunity. And then we got a prayer team that would really love to meet you, congratulate you, put some resources in your hand and pray with you. Because we don't take this lightly here. This is the rest of your life for the rest of your life. 
I can be filled with good things and do good things all day long, but that doesn't mean that I'm walking in eternal life. And I just believe that there's some people in the room that go, my life is not what it seems. But today, today, I choose on the menu of salvation and I will be fulfilled and not just filled. Will you bow your heads with me today? Over the past two weeks, we've had 16 people cross from death to life with Jesus. And I believe that in just a moment, we're going to add to that. And we're going to celebrate people that are ready to give everything they have back to him. Now, if you're in the room and you felt this knocking on your heart all day long, your spirit, and you just have this thumping that's just happening, you can't get rid of it, and you just feel like you have got to start something new today. you got to either dedicate your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life back to Jesus again and submit it all, and that's you today. I want to ask you to do something very boldly. We're not going to call you out. Every eye is closed. Every head is bowed. I want to ask you to do this one thing. As I pray with you, would you stand to your feet right where you're at today? Don't you wait on anybody else. Choose the 16, join the 16 others that have done it over the past two weeks come on anybody amen anybody else come on come on amen amen I will stand to my feet in declaration of the life that God intended for me and I will walk that out every day and I'll do what I got to do to get there amen anybody else amen come on come on your past doesn't matter it's all about what you're where you're going God's changing lives today now we're a family in this room and so I want us all to just pray together, and then we're going to welcome everybody to the family. Would you just repeat after me, every single one of you? Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving your life for me. I've tried to do this by myself. I can't. I need you. Forgive me of who I've been. Forgive me of what I've done. Let me walk into full life with you. Let me walk into submission with you. I decrease so you can increase. Thank you for dying on the cross to forgive my sins. It's a new day. Help me be a different person. I love you. Now in just a moment, eyes still closed. In just a moment, I'm going to say amen. There's one more thing I'd like for you to do if you stood for salvation today. I want you, when I say amen, our church, we're going to clap and we're going to shout and we're going to scream and we're going to celebrate because you're walking into a new life with Jesus with us. But if you stood to receive salvation, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to just take a step out of your row and walk to the back of the room. we got a prayer team there. We have resources you need. We have resources we want to get in your hands. We want to pray specifically over you. We want to answer any questions you have. And we want to spend time getting to know our new family members today. So when I say amen, you take your step out and you walk to the back. But while you're doing that, the rest of us, we are going to cheer. We are going to shout. We are going to scream. And we are going to celebrate because people are walking into the family of God today. Father, we thank you, we love you, we worship you, and we give you everything. God, as we walk to the back to get what you have for us, God, I pray that we would walk this life unashamedly and boldly. And God, we honor you and praise you. In your holy name we pray, amen and amen. Come on now. You can start walking to the back if you stood. Come on, make some noise. Make some noise in the house.